torn up over what to say tonight because on the one hand, what I would have loved to have done is to stand up here and tell you all the stories about the years when I was Dr. Torrance's assistant. I officially was his assistant for four years. Um, I kept on and off lived with the Torrances, have all kinds of stuff I could dish about in all, in all walks of life. And, uh, and then subsequently thought about myself as his research assistant actually until the day he died. So, you know, there are all kinds of things that I thought I could talk about, but um, I realized that the, the best thing I really could do is to talk about the work that he inspired me to do. Um, because that's really what Dr. Torrance was all about, was inspiring his students to do work. And the inspiration started in the most horrible conversation I think I've ever had with any human being. When I first got down here to, to Georgia in 1975, I was all excited about becoming Dr. Torrance's research assistant. And uh, you know, I was ready to go on the research. And after about three weeks of being with him, he looked at me and said, you know, you're, you're not a researcher. <laughs> it was like I packed up my life and moved to Georgia. I never heard of Georgia in my life, but I came here to Georgia. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you're about the stories. And I said, oh, but Dr. Torrance, I want to have influence in the world of gifted education. I really want to make a contribution. He said, you're all about the stories. That's going to be your contribution. And at the time, I thought, you really? Stories? What's the deal? But Forty years later, basically, I'm still all about the stories. It was one of Dr. Torrance's big contributions to my life is to say, you be who you are, girl, and, and I have. Um, so for the past 40 years, which I still can't even believe, I've just been doing one study, just one study, which is getting stories of gifted people and learning about what happens to them over time. It's always been a big fascination of mine. If you ever want to be really, really nice to me, you sit me down in a room full of books like, where are they now? You know? <laughs> that was always my fascination. Uh, even my mother told me that when I was a little girl, that's the kind of stuff I always used to like to study. I mean, this was predicted long, long before I ever got my first longitudinal study going. But, you know, the where are they now is what's driven me for all these years. It's driven me through education, it's driven me through psychology, and it's still, you know, I wish I could take every one of you out tonight and listen to your story about how you got from there to here. And that's, that's my whole fascination. And I was very fortunate in that Dr. Torrance bless his heart, as we said in the South, really took a stand against everybody else who was in the doctoral faculty in those years because people wanted me to do a very standard type of dissertation where you test kids on something, you do a treatment, and then you post-test them on, on the same thing. And he really took a stand with all the professors saying, let her do this, which is basically get stories. And it's true, I've been getting these stories for 40 years. It's, this, it's the stories about this group that in the 1960s were the kids who had the highest achievement honor, the, the highest honor you could possibly get as an adolescent um, in America. There's a presidential scholars program. I don't know how many of you are familiar. So let me just get a sense of that. How many of you don't know about the presidential scholars program? So there's some of you who don't. Um, the presidential scholars program was started by President uh, Kennedy, uh, President Johnson. So it's president with a capital P. I mean, there are presidential scholars at almost every university in the country, but these are the presidential scholars. Um, it was started by Johnson, basically in the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination, kind of to you know get the country back to normal and to give give hope for the future. So he um, and his very uh, prestigious committee contracted with the National Merit Testing Corporation. Remember the National Merit Test? Probably some of you. Those of you who are not American by birth probably don't know that much about the National Merit Test. But anyway, so there are these, um, these tests that you took. They were achievement tests. And these are kids who just knock, knocked it out of the ballpark. Um, and that was the original way you got to become a presidential scholar was that you had these astronomical test scores on, on, the, um, on, on these tests. And then there was this committee that kind of was, it's a very prestigious committee, it wasn't kind of, very prestigious committee appointed by the president. Uh, at the, in those years, it was people like um, Leonard Bernstein, uh, Catherine M. Porter, a famous writer, one of the early astronauts. It was a very glitzy group of people who basically holed up in the uh, White House and studied these dossiers of these kids that included test scores, that included nominations, basically what we would call in gifted education nominations. They were teacher recommendations, all of which was going on behind the kids' back. They had no idea that they were being considered to be presidential scholars. 
Um, it, it took into consideration their community activities, there's hobbies, you know, all kinds of stuff that you would look at to see, you know, who, who are the, the best and the brightest in America. And with this grueling procedure, about three weeks of this constant, you know, reading, reading all the stuff about these kids, ultimately one boy and one girl from every state were chosen to represent the best and the brightest that America had to offer. So it was 121 kids, it was two from every state, one boy and one girl, and then 15 what they called scholars at large which took into consideration um, what we now would know as you know, kids living in poverty who wouldn't necessarily you know, have all the community stuff. Um, it took into consideration weird situations, um, you know, like kids who lived you know, with their, the bedroom of their house in, in Georgia and the, you know, the bathroom in South Carolina or something, you know, just, and kids living abroad. Um, so these are the scholars at large. 121 kids every year were sent to Washington to go to this amazing three-day event where they were touted around, they got to meet their senators, their Congress people, uh, congressmen at the time. Um, you know, there were photo ops, and then in the, at the very end of this three-day, you know, glitzy thing, they gathered in the Rose Garden of the White House, given a medal, and told by the president that you're going to go home, back to your, you know, your home state, and you're going to lead America into the next century. Now, have I mentioned that these kids were 16, 17 years old, number one. Number two, they had no idea they were being considered for this program. So for some of the kids, this was indeed the highlight of their life. It was the best thing ever. But for some of the kids, it prompted this long, long history of wondering, what did I do to deserve that? And it was uh, it, it's something that we now know to be called the imposter phenomena where they're thinking, oh, someday someone's going to find out what, that you know, I'm really not all that. It was very interesting. Um, a year ago, a year and a half ago, John Knox, who's sitting here, who was a presidential scholar, alas, not in my database, but was himself a presidential scholar, organized um, this amazing reunion of 50 years of presidential scholars. And I had the absolute honor of being their keynoter. It was just, can you imagine, those of you who have done me, meeting my subjects for the first time in 40 years. You know, it was just like, oh, get on my Facebook page. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was just the best thing that's ever happened. I mean, I just get choked up when I even think about it. To meet these people whose lives have been wrapped around mine for 40 years was just incredible. But what was amazing to me at the time was how many of them still, because now my subjects are between 68 and 72 years old, were still wondering, what, how did I get here? It was amazing. It was the one question they all came up to me. It's like, tell me, tell me I really deserve this award. So it was quite an honor for me to actually be able to tell them, you know what, you deserve this award. So it was, it was an extremely moving experience, but it also kind of validated that which has driven my work for 50 years, which and it not only driven it, but it, um, I have to say it was surprising to me. I, I'd always known this was a problem for some kids, but to see it in a 68 to 72 year old still struggling with what does it mean to be gifted was really quite something. And that was part of why I was so interested in doing a follow-up study of what happens to gifted kids over time. Because you know from having dealt with gifted kids, creative kids, whether in your classroom or in your household or in yourself, um, that it's not necessarily what it seems to be. You know, American culture has really glorified gifted kids. And you sort of see these eight by 10 glossies, right? Of, you know, how gifted kids have these great lives, how, you know, they just come from wonderful households, that, you know, to be gifted is just the best thing you can possibly be. And while it's really good, there are also some shadows that go along with being gifted, not with all kids, but we tend to overlook that. And that's really been the fascinating thing to me over time, is to look and see how this unfolds, how both the giftedness and then some of the questions that go along with being gifted and how some of the problems that gifted had, kids have have been so neglected and so ignored, but are still so real, and how they develop over the life course. So that was my main reason of doing the study. I had, first of all, wanted to update information about what happens to gifted kids. The last time a major longitudinal study was done of gifted kids was the famous Terman study, which started in the 1920s, where you would hear things like 60% you know, of all gifted females become homemakers. So I knew in the 70s and subsequently that things have changed just a little bit. So I wanted to update information. But mainly what I wanted to do with the study was to tell the truth. 
about what it's like to be gifted to shine lights on what really happens internally with gifted individuals and to see again what that looks like over time. And the other reason I wanted to do this study is I just love the stories. So I have spent the past 40 years doing a study, kind of a normal study, and you have on the table a summary of the latest um, of the, the, it's a really boring study, I have to tell you. <laughs> Don't even bother, you know. I mean, here's the thing. The group statistics are like, you just, it's a big snooze. There's no big, the only significant difference between males and females as, t as time goes on is in their income. I mean, call the Banner Herald, right? You know, <laughs> male presidential scholars earn more than female presidential scholars over a life course, no matter what the occupational level. But mostly, it's, there's, there was nothing that came out of the group data that was that exciting, but then there were the stories. So I spent all this time, you know, interviewing people like in cafes. I interviewed one guy on the top of his car in the middle of the desert. Um, there were... You know, I've been in people's homes, I've been at the beach. I mean, it's, it's been this amazing thing. And I thought what I would do is to basically bring this collection to you. And I want you to at least see a little bit of what I've seen over the past 40 years. And to do so in honor of Dr. Torrance, who saw it all coming. I mean, no one could have predicted in those days that just police or a storyteller would have brought a career that was just so... I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. It was just so rich getting to meet these individuals. And I hope that you know, as I read you some of these, uh, just basically direct quotes. I want you to meet, I want you to meet my home people here. <laughs> this is what I want you to do. Um, you know, I understand that some of the quotes I'm gonna read to you are not representative of the presidential scholars. In other words, I would hate for you to walk away thinking that, oh, you know, Felice Kaufman says such and such about presidential scholars. What I wanted to do is give you individual stories, and the reason for that is, you know, from my perspective, if one story of one presidential scholar helps you rethink one kid you know, for me, that's going to be enough. You know, if it gives you any insight and, and to make you think, oh my gosh, I wonder if that's true of such and such a kid, you know, it's a hit. I'll be thrilled for that. Um, so I'm going to talk about, um, remind me what time I'm supposed to close down, by the way. Where are you, Sarah? No, you're not here. What time on, this, on the thing? It's 7 o'clock? Okay. I think we can do it. I think we can do it. Um, anyway, do you have any quick questions about the, the group, the study overall? I mean, it's a very straightforward kind of thing. Interviews, questionnaires, et cetera. Yes? Only in the income, only in the income, yeah. No, I mean, otherwise, statistically, I mean, the stories were definitely different, I'll tell you about these now. But in terms of statistics, just the only thing that really was different was their income. How did you choose the ones you chose? Oh, good point. Why didn't you want John Knox? Oh, because he was too, he's too young, he's too young. Thank you, it was the first five years of the program, thank you for bringing that up. I thought because to me, the, the people who have lived the most live, I mean, the great thing about this group now is they're looking, as the title of my talk says, in the rearview mirror. So they were the ones who were the furthest out. Great question. And then the ones ultimately, I should say, because I know some of you are numerically oriented, oh my gosh, can we still be friends? Um, <laughs> um, so for those of you who are interested in the original, the universe, there were 604 presidential scholars in the first five years of the program. Um, when I went, I went, I moved from my apartment at the Lions Apartments. You all know the Lions? Still here, I couldn't believe driving by there the other day. Um, you know, I moved there to Washington, what I thought was gonna be a weekend, because wouldn't you assume that for a high class program like this, that the United States government would save all the addresses and the phone numbers? Um, of these people, they're the future of the country, right? Well, I got up to Washington for what I thought was gonna be a long weekend, only to find they didn't know where the files were. So I ended up actually spending a year and a half every, and this was before the internet. This is, this is my greatest achievement, I have to say. If anyone ever says, you know, well, what do you consider your greatest achievement? Here it is. So I got up there, I wasn't planning on talking about this, by the way, I love bragging, though. I love this thing. So I got up there, and they didn't know where the files were, I just had a list of names. So they did have a Watts line, which in those days was a free, a free phone. So I spent a year and a half doing mostly legal things. I subsequently found out some of the things I did were not legal. But um, 
But act, Dr. Torrance used to say, you know, use your personality, Felice. So, oh, so I did. <laughs> I don't know exactly what the definition of sociopath is, but I have a feeling I showed some tendencies when I got things not exactly right. But anyway, um, so I would call around. I had all these ingenious, really ingenious. You want to find your old boyfriend from high school and you can't on the internet? I can find him for you, you know? I mean, it's, it turns out this is a huge skill. I didn't know I had. I can find anybody. So um, anyway, for those of you who are numerically interested, of the 604, did I mention there was no internet? I located 525 people. Wow. Yes, wow, you bet, yes. <laughs> and and that's, my, that's my greatest achievement. And um, see what I mean? You want me to find anyone? I'll find them for you. So, um, so anyway, of the 522, 325 agreed to be part of the study. Miraculously, they were divided equally between males and females. In the latest iteration of the study, um, I have 100 and, uh, I think it's 197 people, um, and a lot of that was, you know, 68 to 72 years old. Life has taken some strange turns. There's a you know, mortality rate, et cetera. But you know, almost 200 of them are still sticking with me, which is pretty amazing. And I continue to learn from them on a daily basis. So, anyway, the first point. I wanted to make to you, and then I'll introduce you to some of the people who um, were part of my thinking about this, is that being gifted does not make someone invulnerable. So many people are convinced that if you're smart, you're a high achiever, you're gifted, you've got it all. And it's one, you want to see me crazy, like really crazy? One of the things that gets to me is when, and I, I hope this is not going to offend any of you, I hope it's not. But when there's, or, or hurt you either, when there's a, you know, like you hear, you read about something bad happening, there's a suicide, there's a shooting, there's all kinds of things, and the commentary is, and they were an honor student. It makes me insane. As if being an honor student would somehow make them invulnerable to all the other influences of life. So, you know, this is one of my main missions in life is to guarantee that people understand that we tend to forget, especially when a kid is a very high achiever or very highly gifted, that there are other parts to their life. And both the family and the culture have influence on that. There was one woman who um, is a very well-known psychologist in the Northeast who wrote something that was stunning to me. Um, she wrote, I'll just read you directly, she wrote, when I was in third grade, a nun of the school I was attending told my parents in a very stern tone, you know your daughter is very smart, which made my mother feel that there might be something bad about this. I always excelled at school, but at the same time, I felt there was something suspect in being smart, as my mother had said it could lead to the sin of pride. So by middle school, I started to hide my successes. I became extremely self-conscious whenever I made a mistake or needed to ask a question, as the rest of the class would go, ooh, in sort, of a sh in sort of a hushed shock. It took me many, many years to be able to ask questions freely. Now think about the girls you know, or, or, or the kids in general. I assumed that to not know an answer was a terrible, humiliating failure. Even in my career, I was so used to holding back that I had no understanding or experience with competition, including what to do when faced with it. Somehow I did okay, but I would have gotten a lot more out of life without that burden. You need to have the conversation with gifted kids to make them understand that you know being gifted is not the only thing. That they're going to hit, you know, they're going to hit, you know, failures. They're going to hit problems, et cetera, et cetera. And also, there is this, you know, the mother in the background saying, "Oh, it's the sin of pride." So the kids that you see, whether in your classroom or whatever, are coming with a whole lot of stuff that have nothing to do with what you're teaching them. And I think we really do forget that when we see all the possibility and the hope and the promise. So it's a, it's a plea for, you know, I mean, it's, it's what we all talk about, but somehow gets, gets you know, um, gets masked with gifted kids. You're looking at the whole child, okay? So that, I mean, you all know that, but I just want to bring that home. Um, this was another one about the family, and again, somehow, you know, I've, I've heard people say to gifted kids, you know, when they're talking about terrible stresses, oh, you're gifted, you can handle it, you know. And all I needed was one presidential scholar to show me why this, this is a pain that lasts for a lifetime. This, this is a woman who was 
um, who's a minister, and uh, she works with um, poor and disenfranchised populations near Seattle, which is completely irrelevant. What's relevant is, is the story she told. And the bottom line on this is you just never know what kids are coping with. You just don't know. They can come to school glitzy and all bright-eyed and ready to learn, and then who knows where they're going home to. She wrote, there were four children in our family. The youngest was Scott, born when I was six. Scott was born profoundly disabled. He started having grand mal seizures when I was seven, and if he went into a seizure, mom would say, Jean, take care of Ellen and Dave, and she would throw a coat over her nightgown and run to the hospital. She might be gone six hours. I was seven, and there was a five-year-old and a three-year-old, and I was in charge. You're so smart, Jeannie, she used to say as she was leaving. You can handle it. So I became a very mature child. Teachers love a mature child. By comparison to home, school was so easy. All I had to do was what was assigned, be cheerful. In high school, I'd be one of the first people in the building in the morning and always the last to leave. I just couldn't face going home. And she writes, shouldn't someone have noticed? It still gets me, you know, shouldn't someone have noticed? So, you know, it's again, it's a real plea that when you're watching kids' behavior, don't just paint the patina of gifted. You know, if a kid is staying late, getting there early, you know, intensely learning, it's a great thing, but you also have to think about the possibility. And again, I'm not saying that all presidential scholars have this, but one certainly did. And, um, you know, it's something to think about. The culture is also, uh, the culture a kid comes from also has a rather significant uh, impact. I interviewed this guy up in Maine, and I've been kind of following him because um, he was he was the lowest um, how do I say the lowest occupational level. He had dropped out of school. Um, he was working as uh, uh, eight, the eight hundred number for LL Bean. He was work, he was a what do you call him a, a salesperson on the other end. And it was kind of surprising to me because he had you know acquired a, an Ivy League degree. And it's it's when I went to interview him, it was not the presentation I was expecting. But he he taught me quite a lesson, which was. Um, the effects of poverty and the effect of culture on a gifted kid. He wrote, about halfway through college, I was feeling very out of place being a working class boy in an owning class college and not experiencing the academic success which had come so early in high school. I went to the college psychologist to talk about this, but at the time wasn't really aware of that, of the impact of feeling, of feeling, sorry, the impact that feeling out of place had on me. The psychologist got my file out and said, considering where you came from, you're doing about what we expect of you. I left his office feeling like someone had punched me in the stomach and essentially gave up on the whole academic experience. Because he came from a culture that didn't, you know, he was the first one. He was the first one. But then the college person at an Ivy League college said that. He said, I could not drop out of college because it was my parents' dream. Um, oops, yeah, yeah. My parents never knew and still do not know how unhappy college made me and how hard it was to recover from it. And I'm sure they never suspected, nor do they still know what a wedge it drove between myself and my family. You know, we never think about the impact that the first kid to go to college, you know, what, how does that affect the whole family? You know? They just assumed it was a good thing and they gave me a better life and wanted to give me a better life than they had. They had no way of knowing what really happened or what it did to me in the long run. So again, whenever you have to think about the cultural context that a gifted kid comes from. And you know, especially if you have a kid who's underachieving, there may be a story there that you would just have no way of knowing. So that was, you know, I thought that was pretty interesting. So from, from that vantage point, the thing I want to make a plea for is that you understand the different contexts that gifted kids come from. The other thing is for you to normalize for kids the struggles because there are a lot of gifted kids out there, as I can absolutely testify from kids I've studied for 40 years, who, who struggle with this on a daily basis. And then they feel that something is wrong with them because they're struggling. They need to know that these influences can cause a struggle, and actually, even though it sounds Pollyannish, you know, their experience of being gifted is much richer for having to struggle with it. Um, so, Anyway, the, the, that's the one, the one thing, that sort of double-edged sword of giftings is something that I want to make sure you understand, and certainly that's something that Dr. Torrance taught me about. Um, and I was really happy to be able to, 
He's, he was one of the first people who really talked about poverty and giftedness. No one was talking about that then. And um, he was one of the first ones to really talk about the struggle of giftedness. So I, I felt very privileged to be around when he was thinking about those things. The second big question, I think two questions is enough for, for one talk. The second big question I asked them was about their awards and their achievements and how over time they kind of landed with these people. And I was pretty surprised considering the magnitude of the awards and the achievements and the honors these kids got when they were in high school and subsequently in college, because that's, that's pretty much their trajectory, is that when you're a big award winner in high school, you, what do you do? You go on to school, you win more awards and more honors and continue to achieve. And for the most part, that was true. Things change, however, when you get out of the formal educational environment. And that was something I think a lot of them were ill-prepared for. You know? So stuff, things change, and your values put on achievement, uh, your value put on achievement, and the extent that it means something to you, I have found, really changes over the life course. And I think for a lot of them, they were taken by surprise that, that awards and achievement and honors in general cease to have meaning over time. And consequently, a lot of them felt like they were not successful. When they were, it's just that the criteria for success had changed. They were often given just one singular definition of success that was usually attached to achievement in school, right? And that's what they got. So that when they got out of the formal educational environment and all of a sudden success started looking like different things, they were completely thrown. So I'm a big proponent of making sure that gifted kids have different models for success and different criteria, not just one singular thing, because I worry about them when they're 40 years old, because I've seen them when they're, I've seen your kids when they're 40 years old. And I know how disorienting it can be to them. So here, here's one story that um, was, was very interesting to me. This is a woman who John and I know actually very well. Um, she's a science writer. She's written 23 books. There is no way this woman could be considered an underachiever. And yet, she wrote, I guess my feeling about achievement really hasn't changed. I still demand the equivalent of straight A's for myself, even though I know in real life you won't get all A's the way you did in school. Not all of them knew that. They were expecting to get A's in life, too. And it was sort of stunning to them when they didn't. Uh, there are very few ways you can get all A's in life, right? <laughs> you know? And the same thing, if you get addicted to praise, you know, it, they were so used to hearing how smart they were and how competent and they were getting A's and awards and honors. You know, when you think about it, like how many times when you go home does whoever might be waiting for you at home say, oh, you are just so smart. I'm just, you know, okay, do you get that kind of praise? You know, it's like, whoa. Well, but the thing on praise addiction is a whole other talk. But anyway, so she, um, so there was an, uh, so even though I know you won't get all A's the way you did in school, my mother said I had such great potential and that it was a shame I never realized it. Her mother, the 23 books, you know. My rational side thinks she's wrong, but I, my emotional side suspects she's right. I just kind of lived life as it came. My definition of success is dying knowing you had a hell of a fun ride. She says, I can do that. You know? <laughs> we don't talk with gifted kids about fun as a criteria for a successful life. And you know, I'm like, come on, come on. You know, fun needs, Barbara and I were just talking about it. Go, girl, right? Fun has to be part of the criteria. I might add, I was gonna say, now I'm looking at Barbara. The last time Barbara and I shared a podium, on stage in front of 500 people at NAGC, I verbally, out loud, made the decision to get married because of Barbara's talk. So she'll maybe tell you about that. But I'm terrified now when she's in an audience that I'm speaking in because, oh my gosh, what next? So, all right. So, so that was one. Um, the definition, this is an, a guy who's a farmer in uh, Maine. His career is not typical. He, he's the only farmer that I have in the group. Um, but the sentiment I found fascinating. He said, the definition of success as being happy with what you've got hasn't changed much for me over the years. I've always valued time as much as money. One change is that I value personal friendships and family more than I used to, and that is an absolute unequivocal trend among presidential scholars, is as time goes on, what really becomes most important is the personal stuff. And I, I was taken aback at that. 
So it's, it's, it's really interesting to hear at this stage of life what their whole new definition of success is. He writes, achievement, nah, he said, I wish I'd had more fun in my 20s and 30s. I was pretty damn serious and worked very hard during those years. I wish I had instead developed better friendships with my teachers and classmates. I did spend more time with my son as he was growing up than my father spent with me, but it was still not enough. I recall a big snowstorm in Oregon when we lived six miles out of town. Ben's elementary school was canceled, but I still struggled to drive into the office to work on a pressing project. I should have spent that day with my 10-year-old at home throwing snowballs. Now that would have been real success. It was interesting to see how many people thought that. And one of the, um, let me see if I can find this one for you. It's sort of out of, oh, oh no, wait, wait, wait. This one's worth waiting for. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh no. Um, I don't know what's happened to her. There's, um, wait, just stop. <laughs> Everyone stay calm. <laughs> oh, oh, here you are. I was looking for you. So this has to do, again, with, um, with definitions of success. I love this one. She wrote, I have been, what's the last thing you sort of think about giving an academic achiever great joy? She said, I have been a full-time stay-at-home mother of nine children for most of my life. I love what I do, I always have. Mothering, even when it mainly involves lots of cleaning toilets, doing laundry, cooking and dishes, even when it's required many, many diaper changes and vomit cleanups, <laughs> has been a constant joy to me. I love children and my home has been and still is filled with them. Being allowed to teach them in any capacity is an exciting challenge. The time will come when I will be free to go forward with another career or new horizons. I worry that I don't have the courage of youth anymore, the stamina for late night studying, the clear vision of my 20s of what to do, or the support of a youth-oriented workplace. On the other hand, unlike my younger self, I'm starting from my later life definition of success, a happy home that I built for both the family that belongs there and also one that draws others in and embraces them as well. I mean, that to me was a real, a real grabber that you know, this is someone who absolutely found fulfillment in something that I'm sure when she was up there in the Rose Garden getting that award, nobody would have predicted that that would have been so rewarding for her. And I was just delighted. Here's one that, um, this guy's a very famous um, author. Um, African-American guy, you've seen him on TV a million times. And I'm just gonna read this to you because I think it's a really interesting quote. He said, I guess I was raised to think in terms of goals and achievements, of goals and accomplishments rather than achievements. What a weird distinction, right? I think that was really interesting. Goals and accomplishments rather than achievements. A subtle distinction, maybe, but the emphasis was always on the work more than the outcome. Hello? This was Dr. Torrance talking about that in the 70s. The emphasis on the work, not the outcome. Achievement to me is what you list on your CV because someone somewhere will perhaps be impressed, but God help you if you yourself are impressed. Accomplishment is when, um, is when you look back and say, well, hell, I did pretty well considering. I like to know how to accomplish things, but I have no idea how to achieve. And this, this one was very interesting in terms of awards, and please understand this is his language, not mine. So if you could get bent out of shape by it, but oh well. Um, he said, as for awards, the Presidential Scholar thing was like the Emancipation Proclamation. I was stuck in a small, bigoted town with a life that was shaped by internal politics and standards. Along comes massive presidential scholars program and set my young ass free. I mean, it just shut everybody up. My father had to stop telling me how he'd never amount to anything. My mother could stop worrying if it was just she who thought I was special. That history teacher was always telling me how I needed to be a credit to my race, had to keep his paternalism to himself. The good teachers, a lot of whom had taken flag for supporting me, got to look around and beam. I got to say, so there. Then I went to college and got a C on my first paper. <laughs> that was the experience of the presidential scholars, confirmation followed by reality check. And then he says, thank God for both. <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, let me see, there was an oh, there's another one that I just like reading because it's so much fun. I love this woman, it's great. She says, and it was again about how life turns out and how your, your, your thoughts about achievement start to turn a little bit. She said, when I was a presidential scholar, I thought that what I really needed in life was to set the world on fire. Actually, I'm thankful I've not set my hair on fire. <laughs> 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 well, there was that time with the, with the water heater pilot light. 
Then she's, this, this completely grabbed me when I first read it. She said, I married the wrong man and it lasted 20 years. The great tragedy of my life was not that it failed, but that it succeeded so well. My divorce is one of my greatest accomplishments. Because for the first time I was able to say, hey, this is who I am, this is what I want, this is what I need. But they don't get awards for that. But they can get that from you. They get that from you. When I realized I would not set the world on fire, I determined that what I really wanted and needed all along was to spend what warmth and light I could in my little corner of it. So am I successful? Yeah. So I, I, you know, the whole idea of giving kids different models for success, I think is really, really important because gifted kids, presidential scholars, sort of in their heightened version of this, can get hooked on a particular model and it comes back and sort of disorients them later on. So as much, you know, showing them, showing kids different models for success as you can do, um, I think is really important. There's one last quote, because I know I have to get off now, but there's one last quote that I wanted to read to you, just again, because it's fun, um, which of course I can't find. Oh, how embarrassing, and you're filming this, aren't you? <laughs> oh my God. Oh, Lord. Right, right. Well, it, it, I know it's here. I know it's here. I just, oh. I have no excuse for this. Everything's in place. Oh. It was right under the other one I couldn't find. <laughs> Life gets bad when you get past retirement age sometimes. Anyway, I just want to read this to you because I think of all the quotes, this, this is one of my absolute favorites. This is a, a guy who is a very, very famous mathematician. He writes, this may sound silly. Oh, he's a lawyer, I'm sorry. This may sound silly, he said, but when I was assigned by my, by my New York-based law firm to work in the Brussels office, I spent a month taking intensive French language training in La Rochelle. I was worried that taking a month off would interfere with my work to the point that it made me ill to think about leaving, but was assured though that this would not affect my pending promotion. And this is a guy who was a monster lawyer with all kinds of awards and honors and you know, I wasn't expecting this quote from him. He writes, one weekend I was driving around the countryside and had a very nice lunch at a country restaurant including a raspberry tart for dessert. On leaving, I saw that a local farmer had pulled up in an old Citroën mini truck and was unloading trays of raspberries. I was absolutely transfixed. To that point, all I had ever thought about was climbing as far possible up the ladder of achievement. But at that moment, it made me think that maybe one should care about just enjoying life. While I remained ambitious for many years thereafter, I think I became decidedly less driven than I once was and have happily always dated that change to that Sunday lunch in the French countryside. So along those lines, and I, this is the, the tie-in to Dr. Torrance, and actually this, this made me think of Dr. Torrance when I read that quote. I remember as a young graduate student asking Dr. Torrance, you know, who was dazzling, as you heard, his number of achievements, his accomplishments, his awards, his honors, his publications, what he thought was his greatest accomplishment. What a question to ask, right? But I, I got very brave and I thought, and he, now those of you who didn't know Dr. Torrance, one little gem I can give you is there was something that those of us who study with him, Tammy, you know this, Banya, um, was the Torrance position for deep thinking, which was he would lean back in his chair and then take his right hand and put it over his bald head, right? <laughs> and he would just lie, he would just sort of lean back and go out into space. You know, you would think, that he, remember, I mean, he was, you know, where is he? And, and then he would always pull out exactly the right thing, exactly the right reference, exactly the right quote, whatever it was you're waiting for. So I was thinking, yeah, let's see what you pull out as your greatest achievement. <laughs> Got you stumped on that one. And he said, my greatest accomplishment, my greatest achievement is the thing I'm proudest of is being Pansy's husband. Aww. And might I add, this being his birthday, the one thing that I just, I would get so choked up in front of you if I could, was watching him every year on his, oh, see there, oh gosh, on his birthday when she would make for him his favorite pumpkin bread. And he was so proud of her because she thought to substitute oil, su substitute applesauce for oil. So I actually brought the recipe that Pansy gave me, including her handwriting where she substitutes applesauce. And guess what? you all can have the recipe too. <laughs> so that's my gift to you. Thank you so 
so much. Thank you so much. It was fun. Thank <laughs> you.